Michael's uh, presentation will be coming up, and um, we'll have him jump right in. Yeah, right. Okay, so Bill Tichy, uh, uh Bill is actually a cooperative extension specialist also with the University of California, works out of the Berkeley campus, but he's located in the central coast of California down in San Luis Obispo County. Bill is a wildlife biologist by training. Uh, he's been involved in oak woodland issues for uh, since uh, 1986, uh, <clears throat> long time. Uh, Bill is actually the chair of the university's uh, Oak Woodland Conservation Work Group, and I should mention that this webinar came about from some priority setting processes that the work group came up with. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill, and he'll uh, talk about habitat issues. Okay, thank you very much, Rick. Uh, I'm going to take off a little bit uh, uh, with some of the ideas that have already been presented. Uh, these are ideas that <coughs> You as planners in your very busy lives probably don't have a whole lot of time to um, really think uh, deeply about. So hopefully some of what I have to say uh, will uh, help you out in that regard. Uh, again, oak woodlands are an incredibly diverse habitat, more diversity of terrestrial vertebrates uh, than any of the other major habitat types uh, in California over 300 species. Importantly, why are they so diverse? Well, certainly a big part of it at the landscape level is because of the patchiness of the oak woodlands. You can see in that uh, picture in the lower left corner uh, on your screen <clears throat> that we have a patch of trees, a patch of chaparral, and some patches of grass. That allows species that are adapted to those different habitat types to occur together. And because they occur in, in close proximity, it adds a great deal of the diversity uh, to oak woodlands as a whole. We're switching slides here. There we go. OK. <clears throat> Our land use activities uh, tend to break up or interfere, so to speak, with that patchiness out there on the landscape. They might make the patches too small for some kinds of wildlife. They might uh, interfere with connections or break connections or set up barriers such that the, the oak woodland becomes more and more broken up and many of the wildlife, especially the specialist species of wildlife, can't continue to live there. So, of course, they, they disappear. Most of, many of the, the native species of wildlife are not adapted to this uh, fragmented uh, type of habitat. The next slide, I'll look at a fairly simple, but uh, certainly a dramatic example of what, what happens. Here we have two patches that are connected by a corridor. A corridor is simply a passageway. Animals need to be able to uh, move between these habitat patches to obtain food and cover. For example, when food runs out in an occupied patch by uh, mule deer, they have to be able to move to an adjacent patch, uh, which would have uh, meet their requisite uh, requirements. We, in our planning, might erect a development uh, through that corridor. There might be a highway such that it breaks up that connection, and especially these wide-ranging uh, animals, uh, which may occupy as much as 10 square miles, these uh, uh, a mountain lion that you see pictured there, they can't make these movements. And this has been demonstrated in Southern California, where research indicated that uh, this was actually in the, in the Los Angeles area, which, of course, is heavily, heavily uh, developed, that if these patches were connected, residual patches of trees were connected by a corridor, they were occupied by lions, or lions were able to use those uh, residual patches. But if that corridor was broken uh, by some uh, development type activity, the lions weren't there. They weren't able to occupy or utilize uh, the residual patches of habitat. The same kind of thing occurs at the more local, the smaller scale. Here we're talking about the stand level scale, maybe a woodlot, patch of trees, a patch of chaparral. 
Here habitat is comprised of habitat, what they refer to as habitat elements. There's probably over 100 in Oak Woodland, 100 different kinds of, of uh, habitat elements. I have a few pictures here. And their relative, uh, according to projections, their relative uh, value for wildlife, or actually the, that graph shows if these elements that are pictured here, the larchwood, the riparian, the shrubs, if uh, any one of those were, was removed, what would be the decrease in, in uh, terrestrial vertebrates? As you can see, you'd leave a, lose a substantial number of species. Uh, oh, they predict up to of large wood, just these logs and so forth uh, that are on the, the forest floor. You might lose up to a third of the native species of wildlife. Riparian habitat, if that's lost, even more. Shrubs, uh, which many people don't think of, and here I'm talking about woodland shrubs, such things as toyon, uh, ceanothus, coffee berry, these shrubs that occur underneath uh, the trees are incredibly important for some kinds of wildlife. There are certain birds, for example, that spend pretty much their entire lives uh, within the shrubs, these specialist birds. And of course, if you lose the shrubs, you also lose uh, that com component of diversity. Trees, or individual trees, as have certainly been indicated uh, in uh, Greg's and Rick's talk, are just incredibly important elements within the habitat. And here's why in the next uh, couple of slides. I'll, I'll be talking about that. Um, in the urban environment, no habitat element, no component of, of the habitat, the literature gives uh, uh, credit to urban trees as providing, and in just individual trees as a, as a whole, as providing more habitat bio, uh, value as lending to wildlife diversity more than any other, almost any other habitat component. They've been referred to as keystone structures. A keystone structure is a habitat element that provides more benefit in the system, helps to structure the system more than its numbers or biomass or footprint would indicate. Lone trees are certainly uh, a keystone structure. They're the impact players. They're the impact players uh, on the Giants baseball team. There's the Isaac Newtons of, of physics. They're the Bill Fultons of, of, of the planners uh, that you're well aware of. Uh, enough said about that. I think you get the idea. Individual trees are incredibly important, and they probably occupy a whole lot of uh, your time as planners. And that, of course, is because, again, because of all the values from top to bottom. Uh, bats and birds uh, use the, the, the foliage, uh, as Rick said, out of valley oak tree, for example. Tremendous amounts of foliage on these uh, big trees. The cavities and under the ground. Uh, we're one of the biggest animals uh, out there. and We might look in our yard and say, oh, there's not much here. It's pretty depauperate. But it's not the case for that microcosm and microorganisms under, underneath the tree. There's a whole world out there. Now, that's their whole world uh, for these smaller animals. These individual trees are also very important in the rural landscape. And this brings up uh, the vineyard thing, which you're going to hear a lot about. You've heard some about it. You're going to hear more about it in, in the next talk. But during the, the rapid expansion of vineyards on the central coast and on the north coast, many of the growers left uh, these individual trees within the vines. And as has already been said, these trees in the vines don't replace native habitat, uh, but certainly much better habitat with them there than uh, if they were not there. They provide, for example, stepping stones. Again, we get here back to the corridor idea. Stepping stones connecting the patches, as you can see in the middle uh, uh, picture there. They provide a passageway. And this is also the case for uh, trees in the urban environment, individual trees in the urban environment. They also provide ecological and economic services to the grape grower. For example, and I think this is really interesting, take the scrub jay. The scrub jay might not be in and around a vineyard if it weren't for those individual trees there. And these jays take acorns from the tree 
and plant them. Research has indicated that each of those scrub jays can plant up to 7,000 acorns during the fall. That's a lot of acorns. And of course, they don't go back and um, get all of those acorns, so uh, some of them grow up into seedlings. Unfortunately, those scrub jays don't always know exactly where we'd like to have our, our, our trees, but uh, some of them are bound to end up in, in a good place, and especially in the rural environment. It's just a really good uh, regeneration, enhancement, uh, de facto planters, if you will, a good, if you will, a good cheap place, a good cheap way to uh, get oak regeneration. And it has been shown that those acorns that are planted by jays, apparently they probably should have a green bill because it seems that those acorns grow especially well uh, into seedlings. And another thing, the, the bluebirds. Greg mentioned the owls in the vineyard. Uh, bluebirds, they're, they're kind of a generalist species. They tend to uh, like open, open country. And again, they can be attracted and be especially abundant in these vineyards that have, have trees. And they, it's been shown, a study recently that was done and in, in, in published in Plus One by uh, Jed Licka indicated that uh, those uh, bluebirds do indeed help with pest control. They eat some uh, vineyard pest insects. So economic services are provided, uh, in a sense, indirectly by these individual trees left in the vineyard. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, really ideas and, and things that uh, I've gotten from discussions with with planners, uh, I can sit here and kind of wear my my white hat, but um, uh, understand that some of this comes from planners uh, on the Central Coast, San Luis Obispo and, and Santa Barbara counties. The first rule, so to speak, with with these individual trees, and again, these are the trees that you spend the things that you spend a lot of your time on for sure, uh, is to keep it, keep it if you can. Um, some of the, the planters on the Central Coast feel that it's time to, in some cases, if the wildlife values can't be replaced uh, when trees are removed, uh, perhaps it's time to say no, or maybe to, move the, maybe to move the development, or in some way ensure that that wildlife habitat is going to continue to be useful, viable. This gets into a little bit of uh, planting ratios, which have also already been uh, mentioned, but it, it certainly is a myth if anybody thinks that you can replace one of these beautiful valley oak trees that you see pictured there with 100 seedlings or 1,000 seedlings, uh, at, least in the, at least not for the, very, the, the quite long term, even though, as, as Rick said, they can grow uh, quite rapidly. Um, so the, the upshot here is really, if you can mitigate it, a strong mitigation is really important. So if you can mitigate the loss, uh, the only way that really can be mitigated, if you see over the longer term or ensure in some way that uh, these wildlife values are going to be are going to be replaced, and they can't be replaced by uh, simply by a bunch of seedlings. Here's a question that uh, has been posed uh, by planners on the Central Coast. Where do you lose more, how do you, what, when do you lose most more wildlife value? From an individual re tree uh, removed in an urban setting, maybe in a yard, maybe in a city, a city central, or if you remove that same tree on the urban fringe where there are many trees? Well, the simple answer is just that probably if you remove that tree in the city center, because of course you just lose all the values that it's providing uh, with the foliage and the bark and the insects and underneath the tree with the microcosm and uh, the microorganisms and so forth. Whereas if you remove that same tree on the urban fringe, chances are some of those ecosystem services, many of them will be taken up uh, by or replaced by the uh, other trees in the area. But as you as planners know, there's certainly no simple answer. What about with that urban tree, if it's, if, say it does has, have a cavity in it and say it produces uh, young birds, what might happen to the birds, you know? 
cats. Uh, there tend to be cats in, in urban areas. The cats get them. Or maybe they become an easy target for the kid with a BB gun. Whereas in the urban fringe, if that, if that same tree is uh, on the urban fringe is, is removed, again, the, those services uh, you might have, uh, you would keep the mistletoe, you would perhaps the, the fledglings would have a more of a chance of, of surviving and, and so forth. So no, yes sir, yes sir, no, but certainly some things to, uh, to think about. In a sense, uh, another point there is the, the individual tree can, has been considered in the urban area as being the living dead. In other words, if that tree isn't replaced in some way, eventually it's going to die, and if there are other trees around to replace it, uh, the habitat values are not going to be replaced. So that brings up uh, the next slide, and the next point being that very important, essential for planning, is that there be some mechanism, some strategy to ensure that the mitigation is going to be successful, that it's going to replace the lost values. And that might, uh, and always will, in some form or fashion, will require a caregiver of some, some kind. Uh, the caregiver, say, in an urban area, maybe one tree replacing that tree. If it was planted in the urban area, Maybe it would be in a, in a yard, and maybe there would be a, a family, a homeowner, that would take care of it for the long term. People love to see things grow. They love to t take care of, of trees and, 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 and uh, ensure that they're going to grow up to be uh, uh, mature trees. Whereas on the urban fringe, if you're replacing a tree, you might have to plant more trees, maybe 100 trees to ensure that you get that same replacement of the habitat values. And as already has been indicated um, by Rick, not all trees grow at the same rate. Valley oak uh, tends to be a relatively fast grower, a coast live oak, blue oak, everything else being equal probably isn't go going to grow quite so fast. So that might be something. But of course, you want to plant the tree that fits the site. Uh, coast live oaks do well. In proximity to the coast, valley oaks wouldn't grow, or blue oaks wouldn't do well right in immediate proximity to the coast. So with that, uh, some things to think about. And uh, should we move on? Yep, OK, or, or take some questions? Uh, you're done? I'm done. Yeah. Uh, Bill, there was one question uh, that perhaps you could answer. Uh, you made reference in your uh, uh, presentation to the reference uh, uh, insect control by bluebirds. Uh, looks like Adina maybe typed something in there, but do you have the reference that you referenced about the uh, insect control by bluebirds? I, I have that it was by Jedlica, J E D L I C C A, uh, 2011 in plus one. And I could send somebody the okay. uh, precise reference. If, uh, so, Ro Rosie, you like. asked the uh, question. Um, <clears throat> we'll, um, we'll, we'll get that posted. Uh, um, so hopefully that will mm -hmm. be Perhaps useful. if they would Google Jed like a close one. L-I-K-A? I, I okay, C-A or K-A, probably maybe K-A, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so... Question, the uh, impacts of smoke on mistletoe infestations in oak uh, ecosystems. Uh, uh, mistletoe helps to clean the air. It actually takes uh, debris such as soot and, and material out of the air. In that sense, it helps to clean the air. It's a very beneficial thing, and it, it, it certainly does no harm on the tree. I don't know whether smoke would adversely affect it or not. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, Greg or Adina, do you have any uh, uh, thoughts about the effect of smoke on, on mistletoe? I, I Probably where the gentleman's coming from is that may have had a, an effect uh, when there were more regular uh, fires, probably a smokier environment in oak woodlands. Would that have had an effect on on whether or not mistletoe was as prevalent as it is today. And I, I, I don't have an answer to that. It's certainly worth speculating. Uh, 
any any thoughts on that, Dina or Greg? All right.